Do you really want to know which object in the solar system is the most difficult to reach? Do you know what the most frequently asked questions are by enthusiasts to space exploration experts? Well, the first one is, how long does it take to get to that particular planet? The second more general is, but why is it so difficult to reach that particular planet? When I happen to be asked the first question during a conference, I usually respond with the famous metaphor of the old man and the traveler. Are you familiar with it? In a faraway land, an old sage was sitting on the edge of a road. After a while, a traveler passes by and stops to ask him if he knows how far the nearest city is. The old man barely looks at him and just says, keep walking. The traveler gets a little offended and continues his journey disgruntled. After a while, though, he hears the old man calling him and saying, Boy, with your brisk pace, you'll take less than two hours. I couldn't have told you before seeing you walk. Just like we can't say how long it will take someone to cover 10 kilometers without seeing them walk, similarly, it's impossible to know the duration of a space journey without knowing certain details. Let me give you an example. To reach Pluto 4.6 billion kilometers away, the New Horizons probe took just over nine years from 2006 to 2015. But if instead of an automatic mission, it was intended to send a crewed spacecraft to Pluto, the travel time would have had to be significantly shorter. No human crew could spend so much time in space unless traveling in an enormous spacecraft equipped with all the comforts. Even so, I strongly doubt that anyone would be willing to spend 10 years of their life to reach Pluto. Perhaps to reach Alpha Centauri, but certainly not to remain confined within the solar system. To send humans to Pluto, perhaps an acceptable travel time would be one year with a decidedly large spacecraft. But this would mean transitioning from chemical to nuclear propulsion. In short, there's no standard travel time to go to Pluto. Everything depends on the nature of the mission, the mass of the spacecraft, and the propulsion method, besides the distance, of course. As for the second most popular question, namely, but why is it so difficult to get to that particular planet? For Pluto, we can answer that there are no problems, except those related to distance. Pluto is an object so slow in orbiting that there is hardly a need to take its movement into account. You can almost aim straight without resorting to curved trajectories like those defined as Hohmann transfer orbits. And this generally holds true for all the distant planets in the solar system. However, there are celestial bodies, even much closer to Earth, that require very long travel times to be reached, regardless of all other factors. One example is the comet 67P churyumov gerasimenko Perhaps this name won't mean much to most people, yet it represents a milestone in the history of space exploration. It is, in fact, the only comet where a human artifact has ever landed. On November 12, 2014, the lander Philae, a small lander released from the Rosetta probe, touched down on the celestial body, an achievement never accomplished before and never repeated since. This feat allowed the collection of an enormous amount of data on these particular astronomical objects that have puzzled cosmologists for centuries. Earlier, the JETO probe in 1986 and Deep Impact in 2005 initiated the exploration of these celestial bodies by approaching Halley's Comet and impacting the surface of Comet Temple 1, respectively. However, this time the mission's purpose was to reach a comet, orbit it, and then release a lander onto the surface to gather crucial data for understanding the origin of these objects. Comets, indeed, have always been considered particularly important in unraveling the mysteries of the birth and evolution of the solar system. These celestial bodies form from various icy substances, including water with a mix of dust and minerals, are believed to be ancient remnants of the condensation of the nebula from which the entire solar system was developed. The probe was named Rosetta in Latin precisely for this reason in memory of the famous Rosetta Stone, an ancient artifact that bore the same text in ancient Greek and Egyptian hieroglyphics. This allowed the French archaeologist Champollion to translate the ancient Egyptian language, which had remained incomprehensible until then. Similarly, in the scientists' intentions, the Rosetta probe was supposed to help decipher the hitherto unknown language of the matter that gave rise to our planetary system. The lander, on the other hand, was named Philae after the Latin name of an islet on the Nile, where an obelisk was found with inscriptions in both Greek and Egyptian. 
Interestingly, the initial target of the mission was not supposed to be Comet 67P. Originally, Rosetta was set to launch on January 12, 2003 to reach Comet 46P Weirtinen in 2011. However, plans changed when the Ariane 5, the chosen carrier for launching Rosetta, failed on December 11, 2002. The entire system experienced a slowdown and then was rescheduled with a launch plan for February 26, 2004, reaching Comet 67P in 2014. After two cancelled launches, the Rosetta mission finally took off on March 2, 2004. Although the launch date had changed, the mission's purpose remained the same – to reach an orbit that allowed the probe to chase and accompany the comet, be captured by its extremely weak gravity, and then lower the Philae lander onto the surface. All of this, easy to put on paper, would lead the probe to embark on a sort of planetary odyssey in the next 10 years. Reaching a comet and landing on its nucleus is quite a complex maneuver, not within everyone's reach. In the 90s, such a project presented seemingly insurmountable difficulties. No one had ever attempted such a feat before then. No one had any idea how to do it. In fact, it wasn't even known if it was possible with the technology available at the end of the second millennium. Comets, in fact, are not only very distant but also move at very high speeds, and there were no rockets capable of providing the necessary velocity to reach and accompany them in their orbital journey around the Sun. Rosetta was thus launched into space by Ariane 5, among the most powerful launchers available. However, to give it the required speed to head towards the comet, it was necessary to resort to one of the most common tricks of interplanetary flight, which involves flying the probe close to a planet and using its gravitational force to accelerate it, a technique called the gravitational slingshot. Before moving on, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Make sure to hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on our daily videos. Comet 67P has a highly elliptical orbit bringing it to reach a maximum speed of about 135,000 km per hour when it is at its perihelion, 186 million km from the Sun and a maximum speed of about 18,000 km per hour when it is at aphelion, 850 million km from the Sun and just beyond Jupiter's orbit. To reach the comet, the probe couldn't do what New Horizons did with Pluto, but had to synchronize its orbit with that of the comet. To achieve this, it had to use gravitational assist maneuvers, exploiting the attraction of some planets to modify its trajectory and speed. As can be seen from the animation that reconstructs Rosetta's entire path, which we are pleased to show you in the same video, this allowed the probe to position itself behind the comet and then gain speed to accompany it when the comet was racing at 55,000 km per hour at a distance of 525 million km from the Sun. Another significant issue was that 67P couldn't be reached at its closest approach to Earth. When a comet comes within 450 million kilometers of the Sun, its nucleus becomes active, heating up and producing the famous tail, or comma, an emission of gas and dust that makes it highly advisable not to be in its orbit, let alone try to descend to its surface. Therefore, Rosetta had to approach the comet at a much greater distance than necessary to reach a common asteroid, for example. These are, however, the main phases of the mission that we present to you below. It's surprising to note how the flight planners found a way to have the probe make two close encounters with two different asteroids. In practice, things unfolded like this. After exactly one year from launch, in March of 2005, the probe had its first gravitational assist with Earth. Two years later, in February of 2007, there was the flyby with Mars, and in November of 2007, the second assist was received from Earth. In September of 2008, there was the encounter with the asteroid Steins, and in November 2009, the last gravitational push from our planet. Yes, you understood correctly. At that point, five and a half years had passed since launch, and the Rosetta probe was still in the vicinity of Earth. Only from that moment onwards did the actual deep space journey begin. Rosetta took a very precise direction, and in July of 2010, on its way, it encountered the large asteroid Lutetia then continued on the route that two and a half years later would bring it on the trail of the comet. That long chase in outer space was probably one of the most delicate phases of the journey. At those distances, the sun is seen and felt very little. It's dark and extremely cold. This practically means that the solar panels that ensured the operation of Rosetta and communication with Earth 
would no longer receive sufficient energy from the sun. It was decided to put the probe into hibernation for two and a half years, essentially turning it off and putting it to sleep in a long cosmic winter during which scientists would not receive any signals and would have no chance to intervene with corrective maneuvers. All you can do in such cases is cross your fingers and hope that the probe is spared from impacts, malfunctions, and any other cosmic accidents, and that it can be reignited once it gets close enough to the sun. And on January 20th, 2014, in a press room at ESA, trembling and unbelievably packed, a burst of enthusiasm welcomed a faint radio signal coming from about 700 million kilometers from Earth. Rosetta had survived, and it had awakened. In August of that same year, the probe finally reached the comet. At that point, the really difficult part began. It was necessary to decide where to release the Finely Lander module. Comets are such small bodies that their surface characteristics cannot be observed from Earth. In the case of 67P, we are talking about a peanut-shaped object just over 6 kilometers long. So, some decisions, such as the choice of the landing point, cannot be made well in advance. You navigate by sight with the data provided by the probe. If reaching the core of a comet resembles, as we've mentioned, a true space odyssey, landing on it is a genuine gravitational puzzle. On comets, gravity is, of course, extremely low, almost non-existent. And especially for an irregularly shaped body like 67P, the gravitational field generated by such a small mass is so weak and distorted that maintaining a stable orbit by a probe becomes problematic. It's a matter of continuously correcting orbital parameters, all this despite the distance which allowed intervening with a delay of almost an hour for the correction to be made. In short, a real nightmare. An even more terrifying nightmare when you consider that to release the lander towards the chosen landing point, one also had to take into account the fast rotation of the comet's nucleus, about 12 hours, and the continually changing orientation of the rotation axis. The good thing was that for landing, no parachutes, retro rockets, or other systems to cushion the fall were needed, but a good damping system was sufficient. The problem, if anything, was the opposite avoiding the lander from bouncing on the surface and drifting away forever into deep space, as there was not enough gravitational attraction to hold it. For this purpose, Filey was equipped with a small nitrogen thruster at the top, which should have kept it pressed to the surface long enough to fire two harpoons to anchor it securely. But for unknown reasons, neither of these two systems worked. On November 12, 2014, the lander ended up bouncing for real, but one should imagine a slow-motion bounce of a few hundred meters, followed by a descent of exasperating slowness, about two hours, and then by a second bounce, this time lower, which made it end up in a kind of crevice, as was discovered two years later when Rosetta managed to photograph it. There, its solar panels could not function. Fortunately, Filey was equipped with a battery with a three-day autonomy, allowing its onboard instruments to perform most of the planned scientific operations and send valuable information. Then it went into hibernation. It would wake up briefly in 2015 thanks to better exposure to sunlight, but without being able to maintain stable communication with the probe. Rosetta, now stably positioned in the comet's orbit, continued for another two years to collect an enormous amount of data. Their study by scientists is not yet entirely concluded, but they have already allowed understanding the structure and evolution of comet nuclei in a way previously unimaginable, which will likely provide new perspectives on the formation of the solar system. In September of 2016, ESA decided to end the Rosetta mission, now tested by 12 years of space travel. But even in this case, it was not a simple matter. Rosetta was a tough one, programmed to withstand the worst situations, reactivate in the presence of the slightest sunlight, and attempt to contact Earth. To prevent its desperate radio signals from continuing to spread indefinitely into space, technicians had to disable it through a software modification. On Friday, September 30th, 2016, the probe ended its mission by impacting the comet's surface near a pit called Dare El Medina, a long and challenging mission, first the chase of the comet lasting over 3,800 days and culminating on August 6, 2014 with the orbital insertion around the celestial body, then the close-up study of the comet's surface and in November of 2014, the exciting and partly unfortunate descent of the Finely Lander. A total of 780 days were spent near the comet's nucleus, studying its smallest details. Clues that, on their own, outline the incredible value of this fantastic mission.
Believe me, guys, going to Pluto, Neptune, Uranus, or Saturn is as easy and restful as going on a photographic safari on the tracks of a hippopotamus. Reaching a comet is instead a headache, like chasing a quirky gazelle across the savannah. <laughs>